Since 1840, the Cunard Steamship Company was heavily associated with the British government. In 1902, the company arranged to build two large steamers to actually hold the disposal of the government. The outcome of that agreement was actually the building of the two world-famous ocean liners, the Lusitania and the Mauritania, the Mauritania now being somewhat lesser known. The reason the ships were to be held at the disposal of the British government and, and thereby the British Admiralty was that in the event of an outbreak of war or hostilities with another country, uh, the ships could then be added to the Admiralty's fleet and be used for wartime purposes. Something as simple as, you know, trip carriers, hospital carriers, even full-blown warships. This is not an uncommon practice, but it is important to understand that as we move forward in the history of the Lusitania. When the negotiations began between the Cunard Company and the British government to build uh, the two steamships, the fastest ocean-going vessel at that time was the Kaiser Wilhelm II. It was a German uh, ocean liner. It had engines of 38,000 horsepower and was capable of reaching, speed, reaching speeds of 23 and a half knots. Now, part of the goal of building these ships was to beat that, to get the blue ribbon, it was called, for fastest Atlantic crossing. And so it was, spe it was specified that these two ships uh, needed to reach speeds of between 24 and 25 knots. To do so was going to require an extra 30,000 horsepower on top of the 38,000 horsepower the Kaiser Wilhelm uh, was uh, producing. So really you're going to need to build two steam ships with uh, 68,000 horsepower. That's going to be quite an engineering feat and quite expensive. So the uh, car company and the British Admiralty agreed that the British Admiralty would finance the entire cost of building the vessels. Because these are actually being designed then as heavy cruisers, uh, there's a number of things that had to be done to them. Uh, for one thing, the, uh, all the engines, boilers, steering, gear, fuel, and vital controls are placed below the waterline, which is actually standard practice in warships. So these two ships were designed from the get-go, from the very beginning, to be warships in the event a war broke out. Additionally, the British government stated in their agreement with the Cunard Company that any questions of design be deferred to the British Admiralty. So once again, for the design of the Lusitania and the Mauritania were under control of the British government and specifically the British Admiralty, which of course is their navy at that time. One more small fact, uh, the British Admiralty also stipulated that a certain portion of the officers of the steamships will be drawn from the Royal Navy Reserve. So a certain amount of the uh, people running the ships were actually uh, naval officers from the, the British Navy. And so looking back at history, the very idea that these were innocent, uh, just uh, cruise ships uh, for tourists uh, was, you know, very misleading. The massive design brief was actually presented to the Cunard Company, and they signed the formal agreement on July 30th, 1903. The chief designer at Cunard at the time was a gentleman by the name of Leonard Peskett, and he had his hands full, to say the least. He was going to have to design these two massive ships uh, that could reach 24 to 25 knots. And also, uh, Cunard decided and decreed that the accommodations of the uh, two luxury liners was to be like nothing else, spacious and splendor, uh, to be compared with the finest hotels in the world. In, in essence, and I will quote from the book The Lusitania, Pesca's brief may be summarized as to devise a floating hotel with accommodation for 2,300 guests and a staff of 900. The hold to cross the Atlantic at more than 24 and a half knots and be capable of carrying 12 six-inch guns. Now, it's important to note that it didn't have six-inch guns mounted on it at, at the very beginning, but it was designed with that in mind. The design of these two ships was really pushing the technological edge of that time. Uh, to give you some idea of the size of Lusitania, it was actually taller and longer than the United States Capitol and Senate buildings in Washington, D.C. The Lusitania and Mauritania were so well designed and constructed that after the sinking of the Titanic, it was speculated that had the Titanic used some of the Lusitania's designs, like the bulkheads and other portions, that it would have withstood the impact of the iceberg on its maiden voyage and would not have sunk. The ships were completed. Tanya entered service on the regular Liverpool to New York route on September 7th, 1907, 
and promptly captured the blue ribbon for the uh, westward Atlantic crossing with a new record speed of 25.88 knots, almost 26 knots. So amazingly fast for a ship of its magnitude. The Lusitania made numerous successful trips back and forth across the Atlantic after its launch. After the Titanic sunk on its maiden voyage on April 12, 1912, the Lusitania was outfitted with double the lifeboats she originally carried. Other than that, the life of the Lusitania for the next few years was pretty much uneventful. Sir Alfred Booth was called to a meeting with the Board of Admiralty on February 19, 1913. Winston Churchill, being the First Lord, was the chair of that meeting. Winston Churchill emphasized that war with Germany was very imminent and decided it was time to exercise the clause of the contract with Cunard and that the Lusitania, Mauritania, and others would be modified to take on the role as armed cruisers. The Lusitania entered dry dock on May 12, 1913. The reason given to the public was that she was in for an upgrade to her turbines. However, on June 19, 1913, the New York Tribune published an article stating that the reason the Lusitania was being pulled into dry dock was not for the replacement of our engines, but to have guns installed. And quoting from an article, it reads, The reason why the cracked liner Lusitania is so long delayed at Liverpool has been announced to be because her turbine engines are being completely replaced. But Cunard officials acknowledge the Tribune correspondent today that the Greyhound is being equipped with high-powered naval rifles in conformity with England's new policy of arming, arming passenger boats. So when the great ship, the third selected by the government for armament, next appears in New York Harbor about the end of August, she will be the first British, British merchantman for more than a century sailing up the lower bay with black guns bristling over her sides. So there you have uh, an announcement that uh, the loose tanks having guns installed. And I'm pretty sure that somebody from, you know, Germany read that. What changes were then made? Well, the entire length of uh, the ship between the shelter deck and the upper deck was double plated. The reserve coal bunkers were converted to a magazine with racking installed for shells. Handling elevators for the shells were installed. A second magazine was converted from part of the mail room. Revolving gun rings were installed on the forecastle and the after deck. The shelter deck was further modified to take four six inch guns on each side. After these changes were made, the Lusitania re entered service on July 21st, 1913. War with Germany was declared on August 4th, 1914, just as the Lusitania was leaving New York for Liverpool. When arriving in Liverpool, the Lusitania was handed over to the British Admiralty. Further modifications are made, including gutting of all passenger accommodations on the F deck, the lowest of the six decks above the boiler room. On September 17th, she entered service into the Admiralty's fleet as an auxiliary cruiser. That wraps up part one of our micro documentary on the Lusitania which of course was regarding the ship itself. Uh, a lot of history compacted into a very short space that you probably weren't aware of. And let's do a quick review of what we learned. Uh, we learned that uh, what was going on at that time was probably equivalent to the late 50s, 1960s, even into the 70s space race between the Soviet Union and the United States, except this was about building a ship going across the Atlantic, uh, the fastest and also the largest, most luxurious ship. And it was a race between the uh, British Empire and the German. German Empire at that time, so that was very interesting, uh, that, that, the way that was sort of positioned in, uh, in, in the world of geopolitics. Uh, we learned that due to the uh, size of the ship and its cost, it was, gonna be, it was financed by the British government, which put it under the control of the British Admiralty. Uh, we learned that uh, part of the crew was actually pulled from the British Admiralty's reserves or from their, their, naval, their naval reserves at that time, so there are people on board the ship from day one who were part, part of the crew who were, um, puts that in a little bit different light. We also learned that uh, upon the war first breaking out, we'll get, in more, get into that more in part two, it was taken in and it was actually to be retrofitted uh, and have its uh, guns mounted. At least that's what it said in the paper, in the New York uh, paper that we looked at. And I'm pretty sure the Germans got that paper <laughs> and understood what was happening. And there's other things that were done to it as well at that time to make room for uh, armaments and such within the Lusitania. Uh, to prepare it for uh, its its role in uh, World War One, to a large extent, like in every 
um, geopolitical situation, uh, the people on board the ship were, were pawns to a large degree. And from the time the keel was laid and when it was launched, and it's all its trips across the Atlantic prior to uh, World War I breaking out, it looks from our historical viewpoint uh, that it being attacked and embroiled in a war was inevitable. And we'll talk about that more in, in the second part of this uh, documentary. Um, but uh, like I said, a lot of that we didn't know. I didn't know, certainly, uh, before starting this. So hope you enjoyed that. Uh, feel free to check my references. Feel free to do your own research. Uh, the idea of what I'm trying to do with this, once again, is just give you a little bit of information that was conveniently left out of our history books and things we were not taught in school and any other um, government uh, communications. I would use the word propaganda, but that's kind of negative. <laughs> uh, but that's really what it was. Um, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I look forward to uh, finishing the story in part two of Lusitania. And until then, have yourself a great day and uh, keep thinking. Thank you.